Hello and welcome to the second episode of the Tigers Down Under for the season. Uh, we're just a few days away from the start of the season now, so it's starting to get a bit real. And uh, joined by a couple of people this time, we've got Logan along again. How are you going? Uh, and we've also got Brad along for the first time. How are you, Brad? Good. Um, we'll, we'll get started with, obviously, a lot of the off-field drama that we've uh, had going on since the last podcast. I think we, we signed off last time, Logan, with you pretty hopeful that Bruce would stick around and we'd make about five signings, and unfortunately that hasn't been the case. Um, take us through the events from your your perspective and how you've, how you've kind of felt about Bruce's departure, first of all, and then uh, and then the lack of signings, um, Logan. Yeah, it's, uh, it's certainly turbulent times, it seems, um, when when uh, Bruce departed, it actually uh, it kind of came out of the blue in many regards because the last we heard from uh, from Steve Bruce was that he was certainly going to be on board and that as far as he was concerned, he was going to be the next manager, uh, the c- continuing manager to take us into the Premier League, rather. And, um, yeah, so for his, uh, his um, uh, walking out was, was very sudden, but um, seemingly we, we kind of scratched the, the surface by uh, speaking about all the problems and there seemed to be a lot more going on behind the scenes than we we're aware of. Uh, and he always seemed to be the kind of only link with the Alums that seemed to see eye to eye with them. So for him to walk out, I think it probably sums up exactly where we're at at the moment um, and, and explains uh, the lack of signings that we're, we're currently experiencing. How do you feel about it, Brad? Do you see um, any, any chance of us bringing someone decent in to replace Bruce or is it going to be feeling for a while yet? Um, my gut would tell me it's going to be feeling for a while yet, and I, it's almost as good as anyone's guess. There's that much speculation of whether we're going to sign a manager, whether we're not, but I think it all comes down to what we don't know, and is that is what the alums actually want to do. Do they want to spend money? Do they not? Do they want to get out of the club? Are they holding on for grim death? No one really knows. Um, the only sort of evidence at the moment is that there is a lack of spend on anything to do with football. So maybe we're just getting some lip service by interviewing a new manager. And so obviously Coleman's been the one that we've um, made our interest known in the most of all. And I think Zola has been linked as well. Um, of the two of them, um, Logan, who would you prefer to see come in as the permanent manager? It's a tough one because out of those two, I would still prefer Steve Bruce, but um, <laughs> I think um, the third option. <laughs> yeah. I think I think Coleman um, is, is certainly uh, he's got credentials and he, he what he's done with Wales is um, is hard to ignore. But uh, whether he would be the right for City, I'm, I'm just not sure. How about you, um, Brad? Who, who would you prefer out of Coleman and Zola? Oh, similar to Logan, I'm, I'm not sure. But if I, if I was having to put one ahead of the other, you'd be hoping probably that Coleman's maybe worth more of a go just with the fact that Zola's been around the championship and premiership before and apart from some playoff close championship games I've never really seen him as someone who's going to inspire me to run a a Premier League club. Um, Coleman's probably handy with the Wales connection that we might get closer to a couple of signings but I think getting back to my first point I just don't know really whether the, the owners are serious about trying to sign someone or just look like they are. Well, we've we've had one departure from the club in Modiami, who, who despite his comments after the playoff final where he said he's a Premier League footballer and he's, he's back where he belongs, he's very quickly decided to go back to the championship for a season. Um, what do we make of his departure to Newcastle? Um, Brad, did you sit, were you a bit surprised by that? Look, I was surprised, and as much as I... I love him for what he did in the playoff final and so on. He, he's a talent, but I don't think he's someone that's going to sit there for 30-plus games and, and keep us up. Probably the only advantage, of course, is he can score a, a cracking goal or two. Um, but I have wondered sometimes, when it's got really tough and not free-flowing, whether he is the player that we would hope he would be in the Premiership. Yeah. Um, so I think... You know, maybe he saw a little bit of what was going on in the back office as well and said, you know what, I might end up in the championship in 12 months. I might as well sign a big deal now. And Logan, how did you feel about his departure? Yeah, similar to Brad. I, I think that we all we all are aware of Modiami's talents, but uh, when the going gets tough, uh, Modiami seems to go missing. And, um, yeah, whether that's 
someone who we, we can afford to carry in a relegation battle, um, I'm not so sure. Um, and then for all the doom and gloom around the club at the moment, we've actually had a pretty successful um, off-season uh, on the pitch um, in our pre-season com- uh, campaign. We've only had one defeat to Torino, which was our last match of the um, of the pre-season, which was actually televised, which was good to see. Uh, what do we make of that? Do we, we see some sort of positives in there for um, Phelan leading the club forward, or, or is it just you know, pre-season games that we can't really read too much into? I, I certainly think it's um, pre-season games we can't read too much into. Um, I, I think the, the probably the biggest surprise is the uh, amount of goals that we, we didn't concede, uh, considering the amount of defenders. <laughs> uh, so, look, it's a, it's a promising pre-season, and I think the, the biggest thing to pull out of it was Curtis Davey saying that the uh, recently, I think it was yesterday, uh, the togetherness in the, the players that are actually there has brought them closer together just because of the circumstances that they currently face. So, I mean, that's probably the, the positive that I'd take out of the preseason uh, so far. And, and how about you, Brad? I mean, obviously, uh, Davies has made some pretty positive comments, and I think Myler as well has been pretty um, positive about the fact that the squad's been quite um, connected and, and been brought together by all of this turmoil. Um, how, have you, how have you found the preseason on the field? Yeah, sure. I think probably the, the what we saw on, that was televised last week probably showed that as a unit they are as tight as they've been for a long time. Obviously, with a smaller unit, you probably find out a little bit more about each other. But um, I thought, obviously, it's always hard with these sorts of fixtures to work out what sort of opposition you're actually against. It looked like Torino really came to play um, and to put a pretty much close to a first eleven out. Um, and other than a pretty much a lack of pace early, I thought we we held our own. It was still a bit nervy, um, but you know, in the end, Phelan's working with a, a pretty young bench by the looks of that game. And I can't see how once we get through a period of games, how we're going to be able to really hold on to some sort of shape or form, um, notwithstanding the fact that you playing the champions in the first game. <laughs> that certainly doesn't help. I, I did like um, Davies made the tweet a few days ago or a few weeks ago that um, despite coming up against the fa- probably the fastest strike partnership in the Premier League in um, Vardy and Musa, he basically just said, oh, well, you got to get the spikes on the boots and you know get ready for a bit of a runaround. So he, he looks like he's um, approaching it with the right attitude. Um, probably the biggest story of the off-season, apart from Bruce's departure, is, is the potential sale of the club. And, and in the last few days, we've had a few more rumours about this Chinese consortium perhaps touring the facilities in the last few days and potentially being at the KCOM on the weekend to uh, watch the game against Leicester. Uh, what do we make of that news? Are we uh, positive about the Chinese potential takeover from the Chinese or are we feeling a bit cautious? Or, or, or what do we think, um, Logan? Uh Look, at this stage, um, it, it almost seems that with all the doom and gloom, um, we'll take anyone but the Alums, um, <laughs> I, I guess. Um, whether that's a good long-term option for the club, I'm, I'm not so sure. Um, I think that it's somewhat of an unknown. Uh, and, well, it always is when you have uh, foreign owners come in. Uh, but look, with with the situation that the club is in at the moment, you just wonder, uh, is, is there such thing as, as a worse position? So, uh, yeah, uh, I'd be all for the, the sale to the to the Chinese consortium if, if in fact, the rumours are, um, are are true and there is a deal that seems to be close. Yeah, I think it's a brother-sister combination. They're worth roughly about a billion pounds together. I think um, the sister has um, had her education in London and has fallen in love with football. So she at least seems to um, be interested in the game. It's not someone who'd be... Um, seeing the club as a play thing and and a bit of a disconnect to the sport. Um, What are your feelings on it, Brad? Yeah, look, very, very much the same. You just, in the end, all you want is some stability and um, whether a new owner, there's there's going to be some excitement, there's going to be some positivity about a new owner coming in. It just gets to that point, I suppose, in recent years where the unbelievable tends to happen. and without knowing who the owners are or what they're actually going to do, you you just hope that whatever it is, it's going to be positive and everyone can move forward. I think probably what's clear is we can't, we definitely can't move forward with the current owners, so you would assume then that anything's an improvement. 
Um, and then obviously the last big piece of off-field news is is the announcement that there'll be protests at the Leicester game. Uh, the Hull City Supporters Trust has put out some information about the various protests that they're going to be organising. Um, there's going to be the red cards before kickoff and at 19.04 minutes into the game. Uh, an independent group is also doing a march to the ground and protesting outside the ground at the West Stand, I think. Uh, and But they're encouraging everyone apart from that to be as loud and vocal and positive towards the players as they can because obviously we also have to support the players even if, if we are protesting the owners. Um, so I'll start with you, Logan, and I think we've talked about protests at the games before, but what's your take on, on the approach to the protests and, and how they're going about it? Look, to, to be perfectly honest, I think that uh, whatever side does take the field on, on Saturday... Um, is, is going to be hard enough up against it as it is. Um, so any kind of protest with the with the red cards and the walk to the stadium and all that kind of stuff, I'm all for. But I feel that uh, once the once the core group take the field, it's the same the same players that got us through the championship that are out there, and a lot of what's going on is probably affecting them probably more than it is the fans because uh, they're the ones that have to to deal with it daily. Um, so. I mean, I'm not I'm not too big on the on the protest walking out at 1904. Uh, I think that's the best thing to do would be to stay there for the for the 90 minutes and, uh, and at least throw your support behind the players. But um, obviously, there's there's that differing side which I also kind of understand. But uh, yeah, I'm I'm all for for staying for the entire game. Yeah, I mean, I think the supporters' trust has sort of said they don't want anyone walking out or, or walking in late, that sort of thing. They just want to do the protest in the actual ground where the cameras can see it. But obviously, there's various different groups all with their own ideas of how to protest, which uh, does run the risk that you know you'll have 15 people walking in late, you'll have 20 people walking out at 19:04, you'll have another 30 people doing something else, and it all becomes quite disjointed. Um, Brad, what's your feelings on it and and protest towards the owners in general? Yeah, look, I, you got to love the fact that people are passionate enough to do it, and I, I still think at least it seems from a long, long way away that these things that are going to happen on Saturday are, are organised, but um, you often wonder how effective they are with owners that effectively have snubbed everyone around them from the FA through to obviously now even the Premier League rules around concessions and... Um, Look, if, if anything, it might bring more attention to the plight um, uh, and the fact that I read on one of the forums there that Leicester's supporters are obviously committed to helping out. I don't know how far that's got, but obviously the, the further and wider you can spread what's going on at the club, the, the better the end result, hopefully. But as far as individual protests, whether it be the 1904 or the red cards, uh, I'm, I'm not really sure. I'm sure if I was there... On Saturday, I'd probably be waving a red card with the best of them, but I'd be yelling at the top of my lungs uh, <laughs> in a positive way towards the team as well. Yeah, and I think that's the main thing, and I think the Supporters Trust has tried to make that clear, and, and, and I hope everyone does do that, where they actually do support the club, or the, fa the players, I should say, in the most positive fashion, because, um, as we've said, they go through it on a daily basis, and they, and they do need as much support as they can get. Um, it'll be interesting as well. People have made the comment that if the potential new owners are also in the um, in the stands, whether they'd think poorly of, of such protests. Do we think... Would potential owners look, ba look badly on that sort of thing or would it almost galvanise them to maybe um, sort of accelerate their bid to buy the club? Um, what do you reckon, Brad? Um, look, it, it's a hard one. I would think that if you were sitting as a potential owner up high in the stands, you would assume that you'd be in either a corporate suite or an owner's box not far from any of the alum or, or the representatives and it would probably make you feel a little uncomfortable. <laughs> but um, I don't know. I, I think it's probably more along the lines of if it's going to have any positive effect like you, like you just mentioned, it would be the fact it might speed things up. Um, but then on the flip side as well, and I'm not trying to sit on the fence on this, but if you're thinking a potential owner, look at all this supporter unrest I'm seeing whether it could even delay a decision um, and that's just my brain working in weird ways but no, yeah, you know you imagine you're sense. sitting there on Saturday seeing what's going on you might be thinking this is a bigger problem than what you've been told so far yeah absolutely. which wouldn't surprise me um, Logan do you have any concerns that if they do buy the club that it might come too little too late and that we might not manage to make any signings before the window closes 
Uh, I think that with the view for that, I think probably if they are looking into the sale, um, they'd be they're obviously very smart people, and they've uh, they've made their living in business quite well. So uh, you know, you'd expect them to kind of do their research and understand uh, the magnitude of or how crucial it is for them to in fact invest in the players. Um, if if indeed they they are looking to to build the club and um, and you know build the kind of financial worth of the club. So look. Um, I, th- I think that they will be well studied, and if they are going to to, to purchase Hull City, um, they'll certainly have done their homework and know that uh, that signings are uh, pretty crucial, um, and sooner rather than later. Maloney, Hayden now bringing the ball forward for Hull. Akpom manages to find himself in a bit of space, saved by Sh- and in. Hull City deserve it. They've got themselves an equaliser. This time, Schwarzer with an initial save. Bundled home again by you-know-who. Hernandez and Akpom linking up. And the Tigers find themselves level. So we've obviously just heard there um, Hernandez scoring against Leicester in the League Cup last season in the game that we ultimately won. Uh, and we play that, that side again this weekend, uh, this time as champions of England. So... Um, I'll start with you, Logan. What are your expectations out of this game? Is it a game that we could hope for a point out of or or even three points out of, or is it more just about keeping things respectable? Uh, I think um, given the circumstances that we're in at the moment, I think uh, keeping it respectable would... (laughs) Would would be um would be saying to to come away with that uh, hold a heads up. I'd be pretty happy if we didn't concede um any any less than three goals, and I'll be quite quite happy to be perfectly honest. How about you, Brad? What do you uh, expect to get out of this game? Um, I suppose I'd hope that we just don't get any more injuries. Would be a good start. <laughs> um, probably. I, I don't know. I I just have this feeling that it won't be as bad as we think. Yeah. Um, but. Having said that, you've got to put a bit of caveat on the fact that we don't know how well everyone pulled up from last week's game and what's going on behind closed doors. But I really do believe that there's times where the true grit of these guys might actually come out, and I think this week could be it. Leicester will be under pressure to put a real performance on to show that last year this wasn't a, a fluke and they're going to go close again, so they might be really trying to come at us. So I think if... I mean, realistically, if someone said to you, you can hold yourself in the game for at least a half to 60 minutes against them, you would take it. And I think all we're going to look for is hopefully that the players we've got have got the real grit and determination to put on a performance. And um, the rest is hopefully just going to mean that we'll look okay in the papers next week. It is one of those games where I think everyone's expecting Leicester to come over and completely flatten us, and the the odds are in um, Leicester's favour and everyone's piling on them. And it just seems like one of those games where things will go our way. Um, Whether we just grind out a nil-nil draw or maybe even nick a goal late, I do get that feeling that it isn't going to be as easy as a lot of people are expecting it to be for Leicester. Um, whether it's because they might take us easily or, as you say, whether they have pressure on them to really back up um, from their title last season. But also, you have to keep in mind, Leicester built their season on the fact that they played counter-attacking football and they sat back and absorbed pressure from sides and then hit them on the counter. And I'm not sure they're going to be able to do that against us. So they might actually find it quite tough to break us down. Yeah, I agree. I think as well, probably the thing that, Phelan's probably been working really hard on knowing that we haven't quite got the cattle we'd like to have is the the defensive nature and pressure that we're going to have to bring to the game. And if we aren't necessarily attacking, it's pretty hard to be a counter-attacking side. Um, uh, but, but fundamentally, I think that if we can just settle in um, and keep a shape and a formation, and that's what Phelan will obviously be working really hard on this week with with uh, the players he's got, is that the game plan will obviously be to absorb as much as possible and try and uh, try and pick something on the break. I mean, in the end, I'm talking a bit negatively. We've got some fantastic quality players that have played premiership football, both at Hull and previous clubs. So we've got guys who know what they're doing. It's more about what our best six or seven players looks like versus other clubs' best six or seven players. And that's always what, what the biggest difference tends to be. 
Oh, absolutely. And I think everyone looks at our injury list and, and thinks that that means that we're down to the bare bones and we're, you know, likely to field um, a bunch of kids. But when you look at it, the, the, the 11 that will be running out against Leicester will actually be quite a good 11. I think of that entire side, only Klukas will probably, uh, and Diamande potentially, will lack Premier League experience. Everyone else will have played in the Premier League before, whether with us or with other clubs. So I think the fact that Phelan made no changes uh, during the game against Torino kind of shows the fact that he, he's prepared to play the same 11 for the full 90 against Leicester. Um, Logan, do you see that 11 as, as, as being a decent side, or do you think we will end up having to draw on some of the kids? Uh, I think it certainly will be a decent side. It will have, be one that will have resolve, and they will certainly fight. Uh, that's one thing that you never really uh, question with the, with the whole contingent, particularly in the current squad, is they don't mind rolling their sleeves up. Um, I, I, I do worry, and I have concerns that if, uh, as uh, Brad said before, if there's any injuries... Um, and we do have to rely on those uh, those youngsters. Uh, things might start to to get a little bit difficult. Well, that brings us to the uh, closing segment of the podcast. And I'll, I'll put to both of you first of all. Um, what's your nightmare scenario for the weekend? Five nil and a Curtis Davies injury. <laughs> oh, jeez. And, and how about you, Brad? Uh, probably very similar, but I think probably the common theme there is injuries. Um, probably the big one for me, would be if something was to go wrong with Hernandez, if we've got any chance of really staying up, we will need him to try and replicate some of last year's form. And uh, to have that issue in the first game or potential injury in the first game would be not a good start. Yeah, I'm knocking on as much wood as I can find, but I think the nightmare would be uh, an an injury to a key player. Um, But we'll finish with something really positive then. We'll say, what would be the best headline you you would see coming out of the weekend? Would it be, you know, a hull snatch unlikely victory or Hernandez bags hat trick? Or or, or what do you reckon, uh, Logan? Uh, I'd say uh, Yakubovic hat trick stuns (laughs) champion. How about you, Brad? (laughs) Uh, I definitely can't put that in the same Yakubovic <laughs> and Hattrick in the same sentence. But um, look, I think as much as it's not a super duper exciting scenario, just the fact that we're able to beat Leicester with what we know is literally the bare bones of a squad would be an amazing achievement. Well, there was a comment made that the fact that we have two fit goalkeepers, uh, Phelan might experiment with one of them outfield, but I don't know if Jakubovic is going to be a hat-trick hero. But yeah, I mean, I can imagine if, if we could snatch a 1-0 victory in, in the death against um, Leicester, especially with a goal from someone like Curtis Davies, it would be pretty pretty memorable as a, uh, a first-up performance. Of course, Leicester, as the champions, the champions have never lost their opening game in the Premier League, so there's... Um, a lot of motivation for the squad to, to try their absolute heart out and, uh, and to get the victory. Um, I'll finish off with um, getting a score prediction from each of you for, for how you think this, the game will pan out. Um, what's, what's your score prediction, Logan? Um, so it kills me to say it. I think it's going to be 3 0 Leicester. Uh, and Brad? I actually think it'll be 2 1 to Leicester. Mm. Mm. I think I'm with you on that. I, I, I have a feeling it might be 2-1. I think Hernandez might be able to score a goal because he's looked pretty promising in pre-season, even with the way we've um, set up. So, um, yeah, I think I'll, 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 agree with you, I'll agree with you there and uh, go with 2-1. Um, but thank you very much for coming on, boys. No problem. Thank you. Uh, and thank you for everyone listening in. Hopefully we've tried to lift the spirits a little bit ahead of the start of the season and, and we'll be back this time next week to hopefully be um, going through a, a nice big victory against Leicester and previewing our second game. But until then, um, we'll see you on Facebook or on Twitter or, or wherever else we're interacting with you. And come on, City. There's no turning back, cause you're amber and black till you die.